Hey, 42 here. We've all woken up after a house party with a pounding head and dread in our stomachs as we ponder that age-old question, just what the hell happened last night? But no matter how hard you may have partied over the years, I'm willing to <gasps> wager you've never woken up with a dead moose at the bottom of your stairs. That's what happened to a Danish nobleman after the mother of all parties in Landskrona Castle towards the tail end of the 16th century. To make matters worse, it wasn't even his moose. The beast belonged to the nobleman's friend, a man named Tycho Brahe, who, coincidentally, was one of the most important people in Denmark. If you're wondering why Tycho had a pet moose in the first place, well, that's just kind of how he rolled. In fact, his entire life reads like a badly written fantasy novel. Seriously, you couldn't make this stuff up. As a child, he was kidnapped by a member of his own family. He lost his nose in a duel with a different member of his family. And, if rumours are to be believed, he had an affair with the Queen of Denmark. For this and other reasons, he was eventually exiled, and a few years later, he either died of extreme politeness or was murdered, depending on which historian you choose to believe. Oh, and as well as a pet moose, he also owned a dwarf with magical powers and an entire island that, in the 16th century, was briefly one of the most important places on Earth. That's a pretty crazy life right there, and I haven't even told you what he was actually famous for yet. Because Tycho Brahe also happens to have been one of the most influential scientists in history. A man who, despite his reputation for living life to the max, somehow managed to find the time to revolutionise astronomy and play Yoda to one of history's greatest Luke science walkers, Johannes Kepler. This is the truly bonkers story of Tycho Brahe, the eccentric genius you've probably never heard of. Are your neurons sweating, trying to juggle countless passwords and payment details for your business? Well, with NordPass Business Password Manager, you can save time and energy, allowing your team to focus on what matters most. Because NordPass Business is your time-saving, productivity-boosting, digital wingman. Gone are the days of forgotten passwords and scrambled account recoveries. All your company's digital keys are stored in here, ready to unlock the internet at the flick of your finger. With NordPass, you can log in from anywhere faster than you can say, forgot password. Its autofill feature is like a digital butler, popping your usernames and passwords into login fields exactly when you need them. Autofill works with your payment information too. You can pay for orders, ads, and invoices in just a few seconds. Communicating sensitive data by instant messaging or email is not only a security liability, but it's a time waster, often kicking off lengthy response chains to confirm receipt. But with NordPass, confidential information can be saved securely in just one place and accessed and updated by all others in your business when you need it. And just when you think it couldn't get any better, NordPass is also your personal data guardian. It scans the dark corners of the web 24-7 for data breaches and it'll notify you in real time. So click the link in the description and use my code 42 to see NordPass Business in action right now with a free month free trial. Don't miss out and a big thanks to NordPass for sponsoring this video. Tycho was born in Nutstorp Castle in 1546 in what was at the time Denmark and is now Sweden. Like Ron Burgundy, the Brahe's were kind of a big deal. All of Tycho's immediate male ancestors served the Danish king as members of the Privy Council, and his mother was chief lady-in-waiting to the queen. But for all their pomp and circumstance, the Brahe's were an odd bunch. At a mere two years of age, Tycho was abducted by his own uncle, who, unable to have children of his own, was in the market for an heir. And rather than, you know, getting their son back, after a bit of grumbling, Tycho's parents apparently accepted this bizarre development, and from then on, the young type was raised by his uncle in a series of fancy castles, receiving an extensive education befitting his noble birth. At 12, he was packed off to Copenhagen University, fulfilling his father's, or rather uncle's, ambitions by studying law. Two years later, he witnessed a celestial spectacle that would alter both his life and the history of modern science. 
The solar eclipse of 1560 was one of the first in modern times to be relatively accurately predicted. It's something we take for granted these days, but to Tycho, the ability to foresee such an awe-inspiring event was akin to magic. And as the moon's silhouette glided gracefully across the sun, casting its shadow, he decided to spend the rest of his life trying to become the magician. For millennia before Tycho's time, mankind had been mapping the stars, and extensive astronomical tables detailing their positions and trajectories already existed. Yet, the more Tycho gazed at the night sky, the more he realised something strange. These tables are all bloody useless, full of inaccuracies, just waiting to be corrected. Like most students, Tycho enjoyed a drink and during one particularly boozy party, he got into an argument with his third cousin. This wasn't your typical booze-boosted bickering about girls or who won the drinking game. These two Danish dandies couldn't agree on who was the better mathematician. So how did they settle this highbrow drunken debate? Did they compare grades or have a good old-fashioned maths off? Nah, they tried to kill each other. But being 16th century Danish nobles, they eschewed the standard issue fist swinging scuffle and stepped outside for a formal duel. There's no record of who won, but seeing as Tico went home that night with half his nose missing, I'm going to assume it wasn't him. He wore a prosthetic for the rest of his life, something that's clearly visible in his portraits. For a long time, historians thought this substitute snoz was made of gold and silver alloy, but when Tycho's remains were exhumed in 2010, chemical analysis revealed it to be brass. After leaving university, Tycho fell in love. Never one for convention, his heart yearned not for a princess or prominent lady, but quite the opposite. She was a commoner. Even today, marriages outside of social circles are somewhat uncommon, but in 16th century Denmark, they were practically unheard of. Such a union was so frowned upon that had Tycho actually married his lowborn boo, he would have been stripped of his rights as a noble. Like Meatloaf, he would do anything for love, but he wouldn't do that. Luckily, he didn't have to, because Danish law at the time permitted something called morganatic marriage. If the couple lived together for three years, their partnership would automatically become legally binding. But crucially, if Tycho was to die first, his low-born wife wouldn't inherit his estate. It was a 16th century prenup, I suppose. By 1572, Tycho had quietly transformed himself into one of the most accomplished astronomers on Earth. After years of painstaking observations, he knew the night sky better than anyone else alive. Thus, he was perfectly placed to spot a sudden celestial change when a brand new star appeared in the constellation Cassiopeia. To say that a new star in the night sky was unexpected would be the understatement of the 16th century, because until now, humanity had believed the stars to be immutable. For that reason, most of Tycho's contemporaries dismissed this celestial interloper as some kind of atmospheric anomaly that simply resembled a new star. But Tycho's careful observations proved beyond any shadow of a doubt that this wasn't the case. Almost overnight, he tore up 2,000 years of accepted science. These days, we know that what Tycho saw back in 1572 wasn't actually a new star at all. It was a supernova, one of the first ever witnessed by human eyes. The discovery was a turning point in his life, transforming him from a rich Danish kid with a weird hobby into a world-renowned astronomer. It also brought him to the attention of the King of Denmark, Frederick II, who was so impressed he made Tycho lord of the island of Venn and all who lived there. Over the ensuing years, this small speck of land between Denmark and Sweden evolved into the epicenter of a celestial revolution, ultimately reshaping our understanding of the universe. The Venn Observatory, one of the first in history to be entirely state-funded, cost 1% of the entire budget of Denmark, making it, pound for pound, one of the most expensive scientific institutions ever built. 
But this wasn't an observatory like anything we would recognise today. The first stone was laid in 1576, more than 30 years before the invention of the telescope. All observations recorded at the observatory were made with the naked eye, and the help of esoteric instruments like quadrants, sextants, parallactic rulers, astronomical clocks and armillary spheres. Tycho lived and worked on Venn, revolutionising almost every aspect of astronomy, redefining methods of observation and dramatically improving existing equipment. As a result, his measurements were, on average, more than 10 times more accurate than those that had come before. At his best, Tycho came within half an arc minute of a star's true position. That's 1 120th of a degree. And it wasn't just the accuracy of his measurements that was so special, it was the volume. In his lifetime, he significantly improved almost every known astronomical record. But there was more to life on Venn than stars and sextants. Tycho was dedicated to his science, but the years had done nothing to tame his more outlandish tendencies. It was around this time he came into possession of his pet moose, which lived on the island and followed him around like a puppy, even indoors. The remarkable observatory on Venn attracted important people from all over the world, from scientists to kings, and Tycho threw lavish parties to welcome them. As entertainment, he hired a clairvoyant dwarf called Jep. He would hide under the table during feasts, occasionally jumping out to tell some random Danish lord that he was about to die a horrible death or inherit a fortune. History has forgotten what happened to Jep the Magic Dwarf, but sadly, we do know the fate of the moose. It grew so popular that Tycho began sending it out to parties as a kind of diplomatic envoy. It was at one of these engagements that the poor creature was plied with so much beer, it fell down a set of stairs and died. Tycho was, understandably, not a moose. Tycho's time at the top came to an abrupt end with the death of Frederick II in 1588. The king's son and successor, Christian IV, was, to put it mildly, not Tycho's biggest fan, and neither were many members of his court. Not only did the great astronomer have a reputation for being a truly crappy lord who treated his subjects on Venn like little more than slaves, Rampant rumours also implicated Tycho in an affair with Christian's mother, the former Queen Sophie. By this point, Tycho had also become a little too big for his boots, demanding huge sums of money to fuel both his research and his hedonistic lifestyle. With King Christian in command, the state's financial faucet was firmly shut, and mounting political pressure compelled Tycho to depart Denmark for good. He travelled through much of Europe before finally settling in Prague, where he became royal astronomer under the patronage of Rudolf II, Holy Roman Emperor. By this point in his life, most of Tycho's most important work was already behind him, but he still had time to make one last, absolutely gigantic contribution to science. It was common knowledge that his astronomical data was by far the most accurate in the world and that made it highly sought after by a new generation of young astronomers. Amongst them was a 28-year-old German by the name of Johannes Kepler. Kepler wrote to Tycho asking for access to his star charts, but Tycho refused, instead offering to employ the young man as his assistant. The rest, as they say, is history. Today, Kepler is rightly regarded as one of the most important scientists of all time. But his most famous achievement, the free laws of planetary motion, would simply not have been possible without the unprecedented accuracy of his mentor's measurements. Half a century later, Isaac Newton would build on Kepler's work when coming up with his own laws of motion that, today, form the basis of classical mechanics. Tycho died in 1601, and even that he performed with panache. It all started, as so many things did, with a feast. According to Kepler, Tycho had been drinking heavily, no surprise there, and the sheer volume of alcohol was beginning to take its toll on the aging astronomer's bladder. 
but court etiquette dictated that getting up in the middle of a feast was bad manners, and so Tico ignored this most pressing call of nature. Arriving home that night, his beleaguered bladder had gone on strike, refusing to pass a single picolitre of piss. His condition deteriorated rapidly, and 11 very painful days later, he was dead. The general consensus is that he died of a ruptured bladder, but not everyone agrees with that conclusion. In 1901, on the 300th anniversary of his death, Tico's body was exhumed so that his final resting place could be restored, but a few scraps of his remains never made it back into the ground. Ninety years later, a Swedish research team found elevated levels of mercury in hairs from his moustache. It was an intriguing discovery because, ever since Tico's death, there had been rumours that he may have been murdered. Even more interesting is the fact that Tico suffered with insomnia, fever and delirium in the days leading up to his death, all symptoms of mercury poisoning. As for whodunit, the two main suspects are an agent of Christian IV, or possibly Johannes Kepler, and there are clear motives on both sides. We already know the king wasn't Tico's biggest fan for the whole he slept with my mum thing, but it may have gone even deeper than that. In a twist of Star Wars proportions, some historians have speculated that Christian might have been a product of the affair. In other words, Darth Tico was his father. If true, that would have made Christian illegitimate and therefore not actually the rightful king of Denmark at all. And it isn't hard to see why he desired such information to be dead and buried. As for Kepler, he had at times a volatile relationship with his mentor. Tycho proved extremely reluctant to share most of his precious astronomical data, particularly the observations of Mars that were to prove so crucial to Kepler's research. It wasn't until Tycho's death that Kepler finally got his hands on them. So, is there any truth to these theories? Well, no, probably not. Further analysis of the hair samples in 2010 found that the mercury levels were within the normal range, and that no other poisons were present. That doesn't mean Tico wasn't murdered, but there's no real evidence to support it. In truth, Tico's life was so remarkable, it doesn't need to end with a murderous twist to be worthy of remembering. This is a man who almost single-handedly laid the foundations of modern astronomy, refuted widely held scientific fallacies that had perpetuated for thousands of years, and paved the way for men like Kepler and Newton to change our understanding of the universe forever. Whether he was murdered by Kepler or by his own bladder, it doesn't really matter. If you're into stargazing yourself, you've probably noticed that the moon is pockmarked with craters. According to the latest count, there are well over a million with a diameter of over a kilometre. Most are fairly nondescript, but a few do stand out. One of these can be found in the southern lunar highlands. At 80 miles across, it's pretty bloody big. But what's really special about this particular crater, Tycho's crater to give it its official name, is that we can still see the spectacular spray of material that was ejected when it formed. These bright white rays are over 2,000 kilometers long and can clearly be seen with the naked eye from Earth, making them one of the most prominent features of the entire moon. Considering everything Tycho taught us about the heavens, it's fitting that that's where we choose to honour him. So, next time you're out for an evening stroll at full moon, be sure to look up and remember Tycho Brahe, the beer-drinking, moose-owning astronomical explorer who single-handedly rewrote the celestial map. Thanks for watching.